thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. We know that you are always just to the wall, nonstop, whitetail addict, doing your thing. Um, and I'm, assu- right. I'm assuming you've already got some food plot action going on this, this year already. Well, we've most been doing burning and, you know, I did some, you know, frost seeding and stuff like that, but it's still been pretty cold. So we haven't, haven't even got, haven't gotten to fertilizers or anything like that. And we'd be out burning or doing something today too, but we got to storms and tornadoes coming. So it was a perfect day to do it. Awesome. It's been pouring rain here all day. So it's been uh, probably the same weather that you guys got coming across. Uh, you're down, yeah. you're down in south, southeastern Iowa, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we've got here up in the central part of Wisconsin, it's been raining and snowing, and it's. I'm sick of winter. I can't take it. I still got two <laughs> feet of snow in my in my yard, so I, won't, I know. It's crazy. I won't be doing anything. So uh, the topic we're going to have, uh, so if you guys are listening to this podcast or mm-hmm. watching it, um, we're doing two with Lee, and we're not going to release them both at the same time, but I'm going to be talking to Lee about food plots. Brad Rux is going to jump in, and he's going to talk about cameras. So if you're watching or listening to one of these podcasts, make sure you check out the other one because Lee's going to give us insights on both of them. Uh, Lee, I remember when you were when you first were starting doing this, you had a small property. Um, well, first of all, let me back up. One thing that I <laughs> there she is. <laughs> oh my gosh, I've been running Reagan trying to find a dumb cord for this iPad that's like mysteriously missing. I'm like, I have no idea where it went. It was there yesterday. But you saved him with uh, with this, right? Or was it the other way around? The iPad. I- with the ipad yeah they saved it with the ipad however um it's going to be a major fail if it goes dead because it's at 42 percent. okay tiffany i don't know if you heard my opener but how did lee propose to you in that food plot 20 some years ago he got down on his knees like a nice man should and <laughs> asked me for his hand <laughs> oh my gosh that's awesome that's awesome not on social media not anything it was just us we didn't tell anybody and you know what i was so horrified about my nails weren't done. <laughs> and I think I was eating sunflower seeds because he's like, reaches over and he's like, okay, what was that? And I was like, all of a sudden I looked down at myself because we were just out like hiking, you know? And I'm like, I started to cry. And he's like, why are you crying? I'm like, this is not what I envisioned. I'm like, my nails are a mess. I made you go to, we had to go to Walmart to get nail polish before we flew home. Before yep. social media, we barely had email. I think back yeah, then. Yeah, before we flew home. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that is an awesome. And you guys had dated though for like five years, didn't you? Yeah. 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 Because I remember the story. Like, God, now this is testing my memory. Tell me if I get these facts correct. Weren't you friends with like Lee's sister or something? Yep. Okay. Jill, and- I was friends with Lee's sister Jill. Actually, when I was a princess at Columbia Heights, her his sister was like one of my chaperones. Oh my gosh. Wow. I know. And now look at you got the best fireplace in the world. That's the only thing I'm looking at right now is it. I thought you were going to say you went from Princess of Columbia Heights and now look at you. You haven't even combed your hair yet. You haven't even combed your hair yet. (laughs) No. I'm just enamored with your fireplace. I love fireplaces. That's pretty cool. Um, It's not really good. So we're we're talking about food plots. You guys started your marriage in a food plot. Um, How many acres are you guys working now uh, down in your farm? Well, in Iowa, I think it's I haven't added up lately because we keep buying stuff. So I don't know, probably around between five and six thousand here, and then in Illinois, we have uh, like three thousand in Illinois. That's but that's your land. Like, what would you say uh, percentage of food plots? Sorry, Tiffany, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. <laughs> no, that's okay. I sent our kids out a little bit ago, and I was just and it's down boring out right yeah. now. Oh, is it boring now? <laughs> yes. It's boring oh, now. I better be <laughs> Yeah, we're making beef jerky. We're making beef jerky out of Cameron. Some more out of Cameron's deer this afternoon, so they have to go and get some supplies for it. Sweet. Well, that's pretty awesome. But, uh, that is so funny though. Yeah, and we just bought uh, you know, a couple of, and being a couple of buddies, we bought a place in Montana. So for elk, so we getting food plots out there too. So wow, that's insane, man. And yeah. how is it to get a tag out there? Is that a draw? Yeah, but they um when you're a landowner, it's it's basically almost guaranteed. And they just changed it too out there um to even more of a guarantee, so to speak, for us as non resident landowners. Right now I got a buddy out there as an outfitter and you get a point from going through an outfitter and a point for for being a landowner and stuff. So it's about it's about guaranteed as it is but now i think they're making it even more so i think they just passed it out there so it is in a dry area but um you know i think we kind of got it covered as far as tags and it's 
it's going to work out that we should get one every year. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. So you're planning, I've never even heard of that, food uh, food plots for elk? Yes. What do you plan? Food is there. What do you plan for elk? Uh, we'll do alfalfa or soy cane uh, fields like now, now in the spring. And if something that we don't get to, we'll do millet. And, um, you know, it, like the same time we would do like a brassica mix here, like a turnip and rape mix. And, and actually we've done, you know, out, out in elk country, the turnip mixes too. And elk love that stuff too. So I, we'll I, experiment with a bunch of stuff, but, uh, you know, we're learning. I believe that. Now tell, I, I'm going to go off some, some rabbit holes here because uh, with millet, have you ever done that for whitetails? No, I haven't. You haven't? Because down in Kansas, I was hunting down there. The guy swears by it. And uh, it was like unbelievable. I shot a really nice buck there in, I think it was December. And Did, uh, he, plant it, did he plant it like in the spring and let it grow and head out and everything? Yep. Or did he plant it like winter wheat? No, it was headed out. So you had like, it was, because I said, I said, it looks like bird seed because I've never really seen millet. I said, it looks like yeah. there's bird seed. He goes, that's exactly what it is. And I was like, oh, wow. He goes, yeah. The, he said, these white tails just, the, the, he said, they will they will walk past other stuff to eat that. And um, I had never even given him much of a thought, but I thought, oh, well, this is a Kansas thing. I didn't think it was like, and I know they grow a lot of that in Iowa, don't they? Um, no, not so much here. I mean, obviously here it's all corn and beans. Hang on a minute. Tiffany's going to try to plug this in. But we're idiots, on. so we're old that's, and idiots. No, no that's okay. This. Not a problem. Yeah, I don't know why my computer wouldn't work, but uh, but anyway, the um, I'll find out on it. Cause, like mostly here, it's you know obviously in Iowa, it's corn and beans is the money maker, so that's what most people will plant. But I, how do we you know? If it's I don't working? know. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I will be able to find out because one of my another place we hunted in Montana last year for elk, he planted millet. Because he heard that, you know, we talked about millet, it was awesome for, for elk, but he planted it in the spring, like you're talking, where it headed out, where it looks like, you know, like I said, the little seeds on top. Mm -hmm. And elk wouldn't touch it. And I told him, I was like, no, when we plant millet for elk, you plant it late, like you do winter wheat. So it's just growing up the, the shoots, you know, when you're, when it gets, you know, during elk season. So, but there's tons of whitetails on that place too. So I'll have to call, I'll have to ask him if the whitetails, hammered that or not because that would be another it would be nice to have another option of something that that deer like you know something to try and see just to see how it lasts i mean obviously they love corn and beans yep. and all that kind of stuff but it's it's nice to have something maybe an option that uh may last longer or a different time of year where they're using or something we're always looking for stuff like that you know give us an advantage over you know neighbors or or just different times of the year that that you have you want to make sure every time of the year you have something that they're attracted to that they're really eating, so you, you hold them on your place, you know, all year long. Well, how do you like that? I plant two acres worth of food plots, and I just gave Lee an idea, so that's a feather. <laughs> that's, a, that's a feather in my cap right there. Let's talk about. Um, <clears throat> I know that you guys work very closely with Analogics. Uh, they have uh, uh, different uh, food plot blends coming out and different things. I. I would like to go through some of the things because you've probably planted it all over the past 20 years um, and give, and I know you do this a lot, but give the listeners and the viewers uh, maybe, maybe some troubleshooting tips um, on the various, I mean, you're planting winter wheat and rye and oats and peas and clover and radishes and turnips and beets and, and rapeseed and things like yeah. that. Um especially this time during the year, we're going to be talking spring into summer. Fall food plots is a different story. What are some of the things that you've learned that maybe you have shortened the curve on, on, on all these various forages? Well, a lot of it is, you know, there's things that probably everybody's heard, but I don't know that everybody necessarily does it because like we, you know, when we first started, you, you just start with, okay, can I get food in? And then, Okay, and where? And I mean, as now that we've been in it 20 years, you're looking for the little things, you know, that 1%, 2% um, better thing. That is, the way I explain it is, you know, you do all this stuff with soil, and you hear about that a lot, but I don't know that everybody does it the way that they should, you know, because people don't have time, except for pH and all those kind of things. But I have a buddy 
Kevin Boyer, who has elite consulting and he's, I call him the dirt wizard, but he, you know, I'll work with him and we'll go take all the soil samples like this. We, he really helped us a lot down our Illinois farm. And so the first year you can see it, all the lists of from pH to the, the P and the K and then all the micronutrients and stuff. And the, the pHs were, you know, four sevens and five threes. And so the, the boxes are kind of ye- are yellow color. And if it gets a seven, it gets dark green. And so we worked with, you know, turkey manure and all these things. We need to get pH up. We really need to get work on organic matter and all these things because the farm we bought down there was big, a big farm, but it was all just hay, you know, and it was at back basically the guy had it for quail. And so there was really no egg type food pots on it. It was mostly all grass and stuff like that for birds. And so you just, this is only the third year, but he just sent me the, the results and you can just see over the, the three years, like now our, our pH average where it was like five something, it's like six, eight, wow. we're almost everything seven. And that's, you know, how fast you can do that. But it just is amazing what you see. Like when you can put a, a have a beautiful clover field and then with pH is not good, your soil is not good and it'll still grow in there. But when then you put it next to a, a field that, is pH of seven has all the micro and macro nutrients and stuff in it. You wouldn't believe the amount of deer, how they just go to that field. Don't even touch the other one. And we had that because we opened up new fields. And so they, they're not necessarily right next to it, like side by side, but you know, we've been working like three years on some of these, on the soils on some of these, and you can just see it that, okay, we have a nice two nice. If you just looked at them with your eyes, you think, hey, they all—they both look good. Why is there nothing in this one? But it's amazing how, how, when you do everything with the soil, how much the more nutrient stuff comes into the into the plant. So we take, you know, it goes out there with the scissor and takes tissue samples of your clovers and beans, and they send them in. What is this plant lacking? I mean, when you get down to the the fine points of those food plots, you see how much how much more deer use them and utilize them, and how much healthier they are, and the antler growth that we're getting out of out of deer compared to what we used to. And those are the types of things that I always think, okay, you put 2% more onto this. Okay. And then we started dealing a lot with water and ponds and things like that. And so we started putting out just water tanks. I'm looking at one right out my backyard right now. They'll come deer, hundreds of them come right in there in our backyard. But like in the summertime, they would drink like a hundred, hundred gallons a week out of that. And the winter time is like 200 gallons wow. a week see how much they need that so that's like another thing that you put you know you put in your put in your head that okay obviously they things are frozen in the winter and they have a harder time getting to water a water source if you can keep something open with an agitator in a pond or a heater heating element and something like this i mean that's that can be way more effective even than a food pod sometimes in there so you're talking okay now i got a little two percent average there there's all these little things that you can do that uh, That's <laughs> all, all right. these little things you can do. Yeah, we got kids running around here. That's okay. Mom. But <laughs> it's these little things, I always say like 2% here and 2% there and 2% here. And now we went in the timber, like we're just, we need to do some, some hinge cutting, but there's lots of multiple rows in the timber. And if you start opening that up, that'll just, wow, that'll explode if you open that up. So we just went through yesterday and burn through all that where the burn will kill that multiflora rose. And once that's up, then we start, then we'll start doing some timber work. Okay. Now you have better brows in your timber. Now there's another 2%, but can you do all the little things that, you know, you didn't do before all of a sudden that adds up to like 20 and 30, 40% better. But that's where when you, cause obviously we, you know, people will always say, you know, Oh, if I had your farm, you know, lots of acres with no pressure. It's like, what do you mean? No pressure. We hunt every single day. There's not any other, not very many people that get to hunt like us that we hunt every day and have my buddies and our friends and our kids. We're hunting every single day out there. So how are we not, what do we do to not push them out onto our neighbors? And then our neighbors, of course, there's, you you go on any one of our farms, there's, you'll find a hundred stands on our fence line. We have a lot of pressure. Oh, I mean, even if I, you, you can, you can imagine because everybody who they see your name on a plat book or whatever, so easy to find stuff now, you know, everything around us is bought or leased or whatever. So, you know, even though there's not that many hunters and not that much pressure in Iowa, we're so fortunate on that. So for us, we just have 
every every side of us is that somebody else will have stands on our fence line. So it's it's not our pressure, it's neighboring pressure and everything else. And that's fine. I mean, I get it. I understand it. I was there too. And I, you know, I'm always great to people and nice to them. If they shoot a deer and goes on our side, I'll always come and help them and get my rangers in there. But the, that's when I, when you look at it and say, all right, I need to keep all the food in the center of ours as much as possible. Keep them away from fence lines, no food pots there. I need to work on timber. I need to work on all this stuff. But all those, that little 40% gives it five, because normally if you can get a deer to five years old, they hardly leave a 40 or an 80 max. You know, and you can then you can say, okay, if I want to let that deer get to six, even when you got neighbors sitting all over, you're not losing those deer as much. So all those little things that you can do um, to add those couple percentage points onto yourself, they really add up. And how you're drawing all those deer in there, even though your neighbors may have food pots and everything else, your deer are still preferring your place and not leaving. So that's what I've really been, you know, working on the last, you know, few years with things. And of course, all the different varieties and we work with with analogics where we, you know, we put out all kinds of clover fields side by side and not just to see which ones deer prefer because they're going to like most of them. For me, what I'm looking for is what rates are they maturing at and what stages are they eating them at? So we can get the best combination of varieties that, you know, if you just had, just say you put out a, an alcite clover or a white and you got a rain and heat, boom, it grows up and it, it's all stemmy you know, it needs to be mowed right away within a couple of weeks from that or 10 days from that. But if you have different varieties, at least you can keep your deer in there. There's something that's still growing while some of it's mature that they're still eating in there. So you don't have to mow it necessarily that often. We can do it here because we live here, but there's a lot of people that have farms that don't live there. You can't exactly get there every week to mow clovers and alfalfas and things like that. So we're trying to come up with, you know, blends and mixes that, will last the longest and still have something growing that they'll still be in there. Even if one of the varieties is matured and flowered out and it's not as palatable that there's something still growing. So we always, we're always working on different blends and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, with different, with different seeds and stuff. And to me, that's, what's fun. And that's, what's great about working with analogics for me is that, uh, you know, they allow us to do that. And all the guys over there are passionate about deer and food and, health and nutrition and everything like I am. So that's what we're always testing stuff like that. Have you been uh, mostly testing those seeds or are you actually developing those uh, on the properties that you're managing? Um, we're just testing them because we don't actually grow them to harvest the seeds off of mm -hmm. them. Um, but we are putting off of the, the results that we get, we are, that's what we're making the blends up from. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by... With more than 70 years of experience in the animal health and nutrition industries, Analogics Outdoors brings its unique expertise to the science of deer feed and attractants. For more information, visit analogics.com. This is crazy stuff. Now, if you just listen to him talk for 15 minutes there, um, one thing I've always said is, number one, you've wanted it more than anybody that I've ever met. And number two is you're a mad scientist when it comes to this stuff because I can't even wrap my head. I loved, I'm a vegetable gardener in my blood. I love it. And something Charlie Alshammer, a couple of things that he always said was, uh, the first one was with, when you're talking about soil, he said, you have a tomato and you have a tomato, but a deer is going to eat the one that has no more nu nutrients in it based off of just, it's, 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 it's built that way. And that's, exactly. and that's what you're finding out there. The other thing he said, when you're talking about property lines, he said, once people fig once people know what you're doing, they will take advantage of you in spades. And <laughs> you have a pretty good attitude <laughs> about it because I can't it's imagine it's what you're dealing with, um, yeah. with, with people on the property lines. And like, it, it is a, it is a situation. Um, so basically what you're saying is it is in the soil. It's like you have to, uh, if you want to, I mean, not, not put your entire focus on it, but if you can focus on that soil, make that soil the best it can be, you're taking away all those other, like what kind of seed should I plant and stuff like that. That really doesn't really matter um, when you're, when you're right. working on the soil like that. That's number one. I mean, especially, I mean, people can just look at, a lot of times people just look at the pH, but you got to look at everything. When you get a soil sample results too, don't just get, you know, the result, just like the basic results. You, you want to get, results that give you all the, the 
the micronutrients stuff too, that what's the sulfurs and coppers and the, the metals and all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, organic matters and all that kind of stuff that, that those, the little things are what will make a difference. You know, pH being high is one thing. Everybody kind of knows about that, but then when you take it one step deeper, like you said, your neighbors can be planting clover fields and everything else, but why are they all using yours? And that's because you went the extra mile and did the extra work and, and did all the stuff. And that's what we try to do to combat, you know, so much pressure. And it, it's like I said, it's odd. People are like, oh, if I can hunt someplace with no pressure, it's like no pressure. <laughs> Are the pressure more than anything? You know, it comes out, we shoot good deer because we let them walk. And of course it's heartbreaking because a lot of times you lose those to neighbors even, but not normally very few that are five years old. It's always the three and four year olds that, they can still rattle over and grunt over to your fence line. And the five-year-olds, you know, once you get there, they're pretty much set in their little spot. They don't need to move. We have plenty of does. It's not like they're wandering two miles off and stuff. They're always just finding them there. And, you know, you might catch them a little bit outside of that 80 and here and there, but not very often. So once we, if I can get one to five, um, normally they're stuck in there pretty good and I don't have to worry as much about losing them but it's always the three and four year olds or you know the giant three year olds that are gonna you know maybe even 170 you know and i don't blame them i mean i was there too at one time so i never I, you know i never say anything to anybody i'm always just hey congratulations whatever but in the inside you're just dying because it's it's like to get a deer that'll has the genetic potential to go to 200 inches or more they're one in a million and so when you get one and, and then they're gone at three it's just like oh it could be two, three, five more years to get one, another one that has that potential. So, you know, and that's that really, you look at it, it's like, why? I mean, there should be all kinds of giant deer, I mean, more than there are. But it was pretty interesting to me, you know, talking to the, uh, uh, who was the, oh, he kind of ran out in Utah, Antelope Island. You know, if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. out in Utah, and it had like the biggest mule deer in the world almost on it because they were not hunted. And it was interesting to me like what he said out there. He said before there was hunting out there, well, I said, well, first of all, there were just kind of odd genetic stuff out there, kind of goofy, you know, because probably there's a lot of interbreeding because they couldn't, there's nothing else coming out. I mean, it was all interrelated. But then they started, you know, they had like a recovery thing for deer that maybe got hit by cars or or fawns that were found and it's kind of like a raptor center thing that they had like for deer that would come in that were injured or fawns that lost their their moms or whatever and they're saying well what do we do with these once they're rehabilitated so well, let's just put them back out on animal violence and so they did and then they said you know starting to get new genetics in there and all the deer were living i mean the only way they were dying was old age or fighting or whatever but the, the deer that were in there they were incredible he's like there was 270s wow. and, you know because we, i've seen some bucks out there because i remember finding a deadhead and i was carrying on my horse and carrying it and the other side would hit the ground and it was on there just giants and so, so then when they opened it up you know just two tags a year he's like well i knew the genetics were gonna it was gonna go down on that that you would never get those giants again once we did that and i was like really this island is huge with all these deer on it just to take two off he said, oh, yeah. He said, you know, they're, the thing is, like, the first year, you know, they may shoot the two biggest deer on there that were old. But now the next year, the biggest deer might be five. And, of course, there's a bunch of them that are six, seven, eight years old. But they're just always taking off the biggest deer. And he said, you do even two of them. And then the next year, and then the next year, and then the next year. But he's like, if they, if we did it where they only shot eight year old deer, no matter what they scored, you would keep that. But that isn't the way it works. People go in there, they want to shoot the biggest right. genetic deer. And it isn't. He said, you know, there's good deer in there now. I said, we're shooting 220s and stuff, but there's no 270s anymore. That's gone. And it's funny, man, I'm that big of a place shooting two deer, just imagine what whitetails would be, because that's exactly the same. Because every young deer that gets shot that has those genetics, they're always getting shot. But when you have a terrible genetic deer, you know, that are six, seven, eight years old, nobody shoot. Oh, I passed the passed 150 inch eight point this, this year, 140 inch, you know, but it's just like, that's the exact opposite of management. And I had, I learned that myself too, just on our farms that we were, you know, when we first moved here, we were shooting you know, 160, 170 inch deer. And it was awesome to come from Minnesota, and 
you know, we never saw deer like that before. So you're shooting those, but by deer, by year three and four, like every ridge has an old crappy eight point bully living on it. And we didn't have any other deer. And I was like, he learned pre- pretty quick that that's the worst management strategy ever. We're shooting all the, their good genetic deer. So now we're the exact opposite. Like we well, have a big three-year-old someplace, which we did a lot last year. That's why I got Cameron hunting this year and stuff too. And a lot of us to take out some of those, those bucks. Cause we just don't have, you know, you can, it's hard to get tags here. And so I can't like have your buddies come down and Hey, let's go shoot a bunch of these management deer off. It's, it's hard to do it. You know, especially when they get six, seven years old, it's like, they're not like you can just go out and shoot them. I mean, mm-hmm. you might have to hunt deer for them. So, you know, we just started really even in places that I have a big three-year-old on a certain part of a farm. That's where we'll just target that. Okay. What, older bucks are in there let's get them out i want him to have no pressure and i want that one to stay there we'll start at three years old planning that that deer to try to get up to that age and like we've got some bucks now now we're passing almost all of them all of our good genetic deer almost all of them at five you know and see if i can get and it's a big risk you know to try to get them through to six and say you know all right so even for this next year my biggest deer will be five but we won't shoot them. But I do have some big five-year-olds from last year too, that I hope they do good that you'll still have potential to have a, a you know, a high scoring deer on these six-year-olds, but we're not shooting the fives. So, but you can just see what you could do with whitetails. If you only shot, if you let them get to like eight, because like some of our biggest bucks are at, through their biggest racks at eight, people think that's over the hill mm-hmm. or going down, but I, we haven't seen that at all. Maybe at 10, you know, you start seeing it, but that was really interesting to me on the Antelope Island, just shooting two deer on an entire giant place. And you look at that's like the size of a county here. Right. You had to just shoot two whitetails in this county. You know what you would have if every one of those good genetic deer lived. If you took one county and did that, it's like, oh my gosh, that you'd have 300 inch bucks, no question. But you're showing that you can do it. I mean, uh, you're doing it, like I said, at an insane level. You've been doing it for many, many years, but what you're describing essentially are two different, uh, two different approaches to high, what they call high grading, you know, um, and that's why you see in areas where they do have antler restrictions. In some of those cases, you hit a wall, and you and you can't, you know, you can't really progress past that. One thing I wanted to ask you, you when you're talking about call bucks, because I've helped Steve Bartilla down in Illinois for over ten years. I get to go down there and kill a call buck. Have you ever found that when you're killing those cull bucks, has that affected um, any of those translocations of those deer on your property? Because I know you're, I think you were one of the first people to write an article for us about that uh, specific home range when you get them to five. But now if you're shooting these deer that are, you know, six, seven, eight years old that are, like you said, they're, they're an A-pointer, they're never going to be anything more than an A-pointer. Yeah, they might put on a couple little extra non-typical points when they get older but it, you start taking those bully bucks out is it working the way you want it to work or do you have problems with that no it's it, it's been working really well um because like i said with they it's funny even like on t- let's say one farm then just the one that i'm thinking about particularly now where, where we shot several bucks off it to do this it's like 500 acres but so we break that farm into the south middle and north and it's funny because the south deer you might catch them once in a while into the middle but very rarely the north deer same thing once in a while in the middle but very rarely you know the middle deer rarely to north south but you never get one from the north going all the way to the south and this is only 500 acres wow. you know it's not like huge but they you never other than maybe once or twice a year maybe during the rut they might go up there or something but we have like two two food pots on the south end of it, two bays that go into the timber. And one of them's close to my neighbors and one is in the middle. So I'd always like try to keep them in the middle. And like in the summertime, we have a feeder in there, you know, just nutrition wise and all that. Obviously we have, I always say we don't have feeders to kill deer or anything like that. We got, you know, tons of food everywhere. It's just to get the, the nutrition into them and to take inventory of them. But so all these bucks are in that middle part all summer long. And we had, and we had a six year old buck that was, he was still a good genetic buck, but he was like 170, 176 inches. He was this year. 
And we know that because he's dead. But <laughs> he was one of them that we wanted to take out because, okay, we left him to six, but he was just a straight 10. He had a little couple of stickers in the base. But he was been this, kind of the same from four and five and at six. And just a nice, big, typical. But he, he, he likely would have gotten a little bit bigger, but not a whole bunch. But we had another buck that was a six by six, three-year-old that has um, – some, more, some stickers at the base too and at three i mean he was already really big at three and then we got a six by five that just a giant frame and he was four and all and but and some other old bucks on there too but they're all in that middle you know during the summer so then when we pull the feeders out and stuff you know like when before we leave for elk hunting so they're out like in september you know on, on places that we're going to be hunting we pull them out like a month ahead of time so when we come back on october 1st the things are out and everything but so we have all of our cameras on these places and you can see from almost the time that they shed their velvet, that that 176 inch 10 point was still in that field. It was a big food plot. So there's still tons of does and little bugs everything coming out there. But that other food plot that's was over by our barn and it's closer to the neighbors. All of a sudden the three-year-old and the big six by five was always in that food plot. So he just moved them on almost immediately out of that middle food pot which is where i kind of want them in the middle of the farm more than on an edge by a neighbor's and so you can see it almost immediately they it's not like they were that far away it's only a few hundred yards but they never came back in there especially during the rut they were only in that other field and you got got them in the timber and some other some other places here and there but as soon as we shot him boom they're all everything back they're back in the middle now so we'll see this year now if that three and four year old that are there and that's what that's the the place we shot a couple of the management eight points out of there too. We shot like three, three bucks on that, on that field there to get some of those other old ones out as well. So we'll see if the three and four year old will stay in the middle or, or if that four year old will now they will be five this year. We'll move that other one out, but we definitely see that because there's places that all the deer like to be. And a lot of times it's the preferred food source and things like that early. When you take, when you have an old bully eight in there, then you'll see that right away the boom the other ones and sometimes you get deer that are buddies it's weird because there's someone that they they get along and that even through the rut they don't mind they'll tolerate each other but you have other ones that even through the summer they won't they're like kicking each other and one will bully them out right away and we get some of those and it seems like they're always these these eight points with giant bodies that are the biggest bullies all the time right. i don't know why it's always that way but uh you know it's weird to see how see how it happens but I mean, that's what we see when you have a preferred area, which is our best food plots and maybe where the feeder is when they're all there. But as soon as that velvet comes out, you can tell which ones are the bullies and you tell which ones are submissive because they're gone. They're not necessarily leaving our farm, but they're leaving that spot. But, you know, that's just right there. There's plenty of other places where they move them out and they're on a neighbor's, but we don't get pictures of them anymore. And then a lot of times they never come back because they get shot and things like that so that's where when we have a good genetic deer that i think is going to go has potential anyway to be a high scoring deer we try to take out everything around it even like that one was 176 inch buck i mean it was definitely tiffany shot him and he was you know definitely a trophy deer and he could have gotten bigger yeah but he does he have the potential of the three-year-old no that Hmm. that three-year-old is almost 170 right now i mean he has potential to be 90s or 200 so it's like, hey, yeah, he could be bigger at seven and eight, but uh, let's take him out now, even though he's, you know, could be bigger. But yeah, you, you take your one with the best genetic and try to try to make it as easy for him to stay there as possible. So, but it's it's been it it definitely works on you know I don't know on the giant scale on things, but I'm not really working on the giant scale so much as the micro scales um, when I find because like I said, there's so few of those bucks that you look at him at two and three and you're like, that's the one he's got, he's got everything it takes. And 90% of the time it's true. They do. I mean, you get some of them that just kind of stay that way and they never develop like you thought they would, but 90% of them, when you see it as a young deer with stickers and splits and long beams, yes, they're going to do it. So we, there's very few of those. Let's face, like I said, the ones that will go to 200 are one in a million. So, I, I do it more on a micro scale. It's like, where is this buck at? Let's clean that out. Let's get the best food in the middle. And we'll, and even when those, when we get those big ones, like something that you want to hunt the next year, 
food plots, everything that we're doing right now is to keep them there and how to hunt them. And like I can tell you, the deer we're probably going to shoot next year and probably the stand we're going to shoot it out of because, you know, I, the ones that I think will get real big, it's not just food stuff, but we may, we may change a food source to keep them there. You want to shoot them early. That's my best, our best time, our best chances to get them early before they break and before before the rut is when we want to shoot them. So, okay, let's get the best food source we can here. Let's see, um, you know, do we need to, to move stands around for all the different winds that, that you might have? You know, all kinds of stuff. Do we need to hinge cut some of this in the timber, try to force them to bed here and come out to here? So, we're, you know, it's all strategy. Almost on a single deer, even though we have all kinds of food plots and, and big, you know, and lots of different farms and stuff, it's usually only a couple, three, four deer that you're really micromanaging. So like I said, we don't do it a macro scale of just like every farm trying to shoot the old ones off. It's more where I have a young one like that, that we try to protect them and keep them in there. This episode is also brought to you by Mossberg. Mossberg has been supplying American hunters with quality firearms for over a hundred years. Over the years, they've upheld their commitment to innovation by creating a handful of firearms that have shaped the way we hunt today. For more information, visit Mossberg.com. Have you had to deal with any disease problems in your uh, Iowa farm? E- EHD in the past, or... not EHD a ton early, like do that 12 to 15, but that's the reason that that we moved over to, uh, to analogics. And I think that's a story that probably needs to get out there more. I don't, I don't think they're, because most people that talk to about this, they don't know about it. So I think we and they have to do a better job of getting that out there. But um, their, their pellets that they have, how that's basically eliminated EHD for us. Wow, that's fascinating. What... Yeah, and I can, you got a minute, I can just tell you, you uh, know, yeah. if we want to talk about that just for a minute here, I know sure. maybe it's just the food pots or anything, but just I'll just sum it up quickly. You know, for a lot of people, you think, oh, you know, they can live through EHD and, you know, you just want to keep them healthy and, and this and that. And a lot of people maybe think like our, like the analogics the pellets or whatever, oh, they just keep them healthy. But that's really not the case. Um, analogics, their parent company is a big animal lab. Mm-hmm. Like, so if there's, you know, hoof and mouth disease or for any disease that came with the vaccines and all that stuff, it's mostly for the hog industry and stuff. And a good example would be, uh, everything's like we want uh, the, our, your meat or your chickens not non-GMO or not, no antibiotics. And you, they'll advertise that, no antibiotics. But it's not really that, you, hey, you're just throwing a bunch of chickens out there and the 10 that live, we're going to sell those. You know, they're still doing something. Mm-hmm. So it was for the analogic parent company that comes up with all those ways to do that. And there's all these um, you know, natural, like like essential oils and things like that that are like on, not on the FDA list of, let's say chemicals or whatever so they're like free free elements that they not considered like a chemical or anything like that they're natural like a you know a natural medication or whatever and so they and a lot of people take like the vaccine for ehd since they made those too for for you know high fence places whatever where you could actually inject them or whatever so they had they had the vaccine so now they've made you know spent tons of money on coming up with this is for the antibiotics. Okay, here's the antibiotics that we normally give. Now let's do all these essential oils and probiotics and prebiotics or whatever they are, the things that are, are like on the free list. There's a name for them. I can't remember what it was, but like the free list that wouldn't be like a, considered an FDA chemical or whatever. So then they'd match all these up, these like essential oils and things to, to mimic the antibiotics that they were given these chickens and hogs and cattle and the else. And so they come up with a antibiotic and it's basically all natural. So that's what they're doing now with all the chickens and all that stuff. It's not that they're just not giving them any antibiotics. They're giving them things that are naturally occurring, like the essential oil stuff to keep them healthy and alive, but it's not considered a, a, a chemical antibiotic. So once they did all that, and obviously that's all done, you see, you hear all the stuff is not no antibiotics and GMO stuff and everything like that. They're still, they're keeping them alive through these other methods. So once they did that, you know, Mark and some of the other people at Analogics were just were huge hunters. So they worked in the labs and stuff, and that's why they started Analogics. Said, "Hey, because we're big mm-hmm. deer hunters, 
move something? Why can't we take some of that technology that we already spent millions on over here in the lab side and just take the EHD vaccine and do the same thing with all the with the uh, essential oils and all that stuff? So that's what they did. So that's what's in their pellet right now. And since I started feeding that those pellets, and there's a there's a mix of pellets and corn and roasted soybeans and soy oil. And there's different ratios, like the four times of the year, how you mix the corn and beans. But it always has that that pellet in there. And since we started feeding that now, I think what year it was, like 15 was like the last year wow. of EHD that was bad. So ever since then, so we haven't found another deer from EHD dead since. And That's crazy. You're talking eight years just about. Yeah. And not that, not that I haven't found a few deer that were dead that looked like they died early but they weren't i mean it may i i can maybe in those eight years maybe think of two or three but they were deer that weren't living on ours that they that didn't weren't there all summer mm-hmm. feeding on them. so anyway the thing that made me really say yep this is working was a lot of people know jeff probes that was mm-hmm. you know and breweries and he worked for whitetail properties now on the missouri side right here and he's a friend of mine and a couple of years after i think it might have been like 17 or 18 that i was out west elk hunting and he called me or texted me and said hey how many dead deer we found out there because we have a big we have a farm and that jeff has the neighboring farm that him and some of his buddies hunt or whatever and it's not a road or anything it's just a fence line i mean it's that's the only difference between mine and theirs is the fence and I said, yeah, we haven't found any Jeff. You know, he said, we found like 20 something dead deer over here already. And I said, like, oh no, you know. And we had a big deer we called Diamond on that farm that year. And I said, like, well, we're still getting pictures of all these deer. You know, I haven't, you know, all our good ones I'm still getting pictures of, but you still just feel like, you know, okay, we better get out there and, and, and hopefully that Diamond will stay alive until, you know, we get there and stuff. So we're just worried that whole year. And so we got home from elk hunting like October 1st and I told Tiffany, you got to get out there. So we went and put up a stand up for him where he was, we had a cornfield and a gate gap and a big clover field. And he was going back in between them all the time. And he was still doing that pretty regular. So she went out and that first day, she went and shot him and he ran down into the creek and that's where he died is in the creek. So we had to, we couldn't get a ranger or anything in there. So we had to walk us all up through the creek and then get a four wheeler in there. But so just even blood trail went through all the creek and it was like, not a dead deer anywhere. You know, normally in those EHD years, you got used to that. You could smell them, you get well, in the creek. Terrible, and you find- yeah. Yeah, terrible. And so throughout that whole year, we never found one. And it's like, this isn't like I said, across the road, this is across the fence. And I don't remember if you even told me how many, if it was 30 or something that they found total on that side, but not one on our side, you know, and especially like not the ones that were at our feeders and stuff all year. And even though it's a big expense for me and stuff, I can see the difference that that's made because, you know, we haven't had a huge outbreak in Iowa of, of EHD like we did through those those 2012 to 2015. But there's certainly been pockets of it where, you know, man, at our pond, we found this many data and this, you like, you know, just kind of more localized pieces, but we have not lost any in, in all those years. And on the other side, it's like, from the time we moved down here, the first 15 years, you know, from 2003 to 2015 that year, we shot like one 200 inch deer and I maybe knew of two others. And of course we had less land then and stuff, but not, not a lot. I mean, we still had a bunch, we were still managing stuff back then. And, you know, you still had a lot of big deer. And, but now between once I started feeding that in like 2016, through now i've shot five 200 inch deer oh. and we've had several others that were there that we left and you know just never came back and one i when i found dead i don't know what he died from he got hit by a car or somebody a neighbor hit him or if he died from fighting or what but I, is it just a coincidence that you know we had that many 200s in the last sense i've been feeding that in the last think, seven years so. or not so yeah i don't either but you know it's always up. I don't want to say, hey, it's a miracle feed or anything well, like that. Well, there's but, uh, other things that you're talking about, too, though, that you're doing that's helping. But uh, everything put together with that, it's sure some compelling uh, 
uh, evidence that you're doing. I, I'm surprised. I had not heard that. I, I had not heard that success. I hope that um, I hope that someday we can say the same thing about chronic wasting disease. That we could have something like that, where it's like uh, you you could you know, the deer could somehow build a resistance or um, th- right. That's not going to be the disease that th- we have seen it in some states. Wyoming is one. Um, Colorado right. is another. Different landscapes than Iowa, different landscapes than here, different landscape than, you know, Alabama or Georgia or Pennsylvania or even New York. But um, it's, it's still, it gives me hope that uh, there could be something done about that. For sure. And, I, and, and I, I'm not sure if they, like their animal lab, I mean, obviously the, there's a lot of info from the parent company, the labs, that just funnels down into analogic. So, but, you know, it was probably like the hoof and mouth disease when they had it in cattle and stuff like that. When there's an emergency, you know, the money will be spent to do it. But I think at this point, they could probably do something about it, maybe. But I just don't know that it's been an emergency. You know, like deer aren't just dying all over the place right. and dead. And I have concerns about that too. People talk about, you know, feeders and everything else. And I'm just like, well, I mean, with the state, if they say it's illegal to feed, well, then we won. We would figure out something else. But as long as it's legal, and for me here, I've never found any dead from anything really. I mean, of course, you find some dead from fighting or whatever, like mm-hmm. anywhere else. But I still think at this point, even you know, keeping chronic wasting disease in mind, we have lots of feeders. I mean, so I don't pile a whole bunch into one spot. But then you, when you sit here and you watch deer long enough. Like I, I wrap my backyard. We have a big food plot. There's tons of deer around our house every day. And you watch how many times those deer all the time over licking each other and touching their noses and stuff. I was like, I don't know that just being at a feeder, because each feeder, you might, you might have 15 or 20 deer in there, but I, I can watch 70 deer right in this field right here. I'm not sure that just when you watch deer long enough, how much they are touching their noses and licking each other and all this stuff. I don't know that the 20 minutes they come into a feeder at night is going to make that much of a difference. Right. I agree with you. Yep. And, you know, as long as it's legal here and I know how many deer I'm saving from the EHD side, the healthy side, I mean, they have stuff in there they call it technology that we've been working on, keep ticks off of them. And it's been working like a charm. I mean, you see these deer, you know, at first before their ears look like barnacles, and look at every deer we shot. You go back even and look at our video footage of hunts from 2003 when we moved down here to 2015. How many of them, how many emails and texts and stuff people, hey, why are all those, why are their backs, you know, bald? Is that from going under fences? And no, they got a billion ticks on me. Shoot, and they sit and itch all day and scratch. Since we've been using that, you look now, very little. Probably none of that. You shoot these deer now and they're big, fat, big beautiful coats no ticks on the ears are clean as a whistle he's going to think about having ten thousand ticks on you the whole year what's that that stress wise and blood loss wise and disease wise just there's so many benefits to me with feeding these analogic pellets with keeping them alive and keeping them healthy and to me it just just far outweighs the concerns of cwd because to me i mean if we were finding hundreds and hundreds of deer dead like we did in the ehd years from chronic wasting disease all right well then that'd be an emergency we would stop we'd be doing whatever we could but that is not the emergency that it it could be but it's not to me at this point and like i said just watching these deer i don't know that they're always licking each other and touching each other i I don't think you're going to stop that mutual grooming and working at uh, licking branches and a fawn uh uh grooming of I mean of dole grooming a fawn um it's just it's like you said it's never ending it's all day long yep all day long you can watch me here every deer sitting you know two bucks that they're they'll sit there for half an hour licking one of the lick the other one's ears and stuff for half an hour like, what are you guys doing but they're always they're always touching each other and touching their noses and licking and like i said licking branches and all that stuff so I, you know, people might get concerned about a feeder, but when you look at the big picture of things for what it's doing for us health-wise, um, it far outweighs 
you know, what my concerns are, which I do have concern for CWP, obviously, because I love these animals. I mean, obviously they're my job, but they're only my job because it just fell into it that way. I mean, these animals are, you know, they're like my dogs, you know, they're, I, you just love those things. And I just want to see them healthy as possible. And if I thought there was a risk of them dying from CWD, you know, more that the feeders would be, you know, promoting that, I wouldn't be doing it. I, I, I took out what's best for them. It's almost like your family. If it was, you know, I guess and I could almost come down to like the COVID vaccines the people. It's like, do you think, obviously there might be some health risk with it, but does it help more than this and that? So you, you, make your decisions on that based on the information you have or what you see. And, you know, there's always a good with the bad, but you know, you just figure what you think is the best to, to do for your family. And same for me, like for my deer. And that's what I go with. I agree with you. Well, we're going to, we're going to cut this one short. I'm going to have to get you back and, and talk about food pods more on, on another time. We're going to get Brad over here. Uh, and we'll right. just, just start the second one, but just in this one naturally. And so they would end this one because they won't be tied. Okay. So, Lee, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Um, it, it's always good to catch up. I'm glad Tiffany got to make the, uh, the uh, appearance as well. Um, so yeah. you're still doing the TV show. Where can people find you and connect with you socially? Yeah, like the TV show obviously is on the Outdoor Channel, but now basically on any of the um, the, the platforms, if you have even Hulu and anything like that, you can always catch the Outdoor Channel on those, you know, and then also on social media, we started doing our YouTube stuff a lot more because there's only so much you can get into a, a, a TV show. So all the off season stuff, just burning and all the things that we do every single day. So start looking for a way bigger presence on YouTube. So, you know, check us out on YouTube. It, and is, it, is it the crush? Is that the, the name of the channel? Yep. Under the same name. Yeah. Okay. Crush with Lee yeah. and Tiffany. Well, thanks for joining us, Lee. Really appreciate uh, seeing you. And I hope you have a great spring. You too, buddy. Okay, for Lee Lakoski, I'm Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now. Again, check us out wherever podcasts are dropped, or you can watch them all on YouTube, Facebook, and go to deerandeerhunting.com. Until next Thursday, we will bring you another Deer Talk podcast then. We'll see you then. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.